Sorry, I needed to, to make a change there. Okay. Ooh. Okay. And uh, oftentimes the books of prophecy are a collection of sermons. Um, uh, whereas this is just kind of like one little snippet of a sermon. So what you see in the typical books of prophecy are people who uh, say all kinds of messages, different times that they speak to the people about their errant ways and how they need to turn back to God. But for Jonah's story, it's just this one overarching story. Uh, and instead of a story, uh, it, it is uh, placed in the canon of the minor prophets but it lets us know about something that happened to the prophet himself. In other words, his life is the message. Places where he didn't necessarily get the message right the first time, or he ran from the message, he didn't wanna hear it, and how that worked out for him. And so the prophecy is doing sometimes what preachers do in modern days. They're telling you a piece of scripture and advice, counsel from godly, and they're using their own lives where they have erred or succeeded in keeping God's word as an example. So Jonah's story is very different from the other prophet stories in the fact that he said, this is my life. And let me show you that it is the prophetic word of God as lived through me when people aren't always doing what God has asked them to do. Now, to learn about Jonah's story, we don't learn as much from Jonah himself as we do by looking historically at his beginning. And his beginning is actually found in the second book of Kings, chapter 14, verses 23 to 24. And so I don't know if you've got your Bible handy or not today, but I'm just going to read that to you. And it says, in the 15th year of Amaziah, son of Johash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, son of Johash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria, and he reigned for 41 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn away from any of the sins of Jeroboam, son of Naboth, which he had caused Israel to commit. He was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Labo Hama of the Sea of Abaha in accordance with the word of the Lord. The king of Israel spoke him through his servant, and here's the word, Jonah, son of Amittah, the prophet from Geth Hepper. So what we learn in all those weird words is the origin of Jonah. Jonah comes from a prophetic family. He is the son, it tells us, of a prophet from Gath Hepper. Now, Gath Hepper was in the tribe of Zebulun. And which was in northern Israel, and it's one of the tribes that's uh, normally associated with a Phoenician port city. So in the days in which he's prophesying, uh, which they think is about the 8th century or so, Jeroboam II was the king, and they uh, believe he was one of the most successful kings of the northern kingdom, and there weren't very many of them. Uh, and it's only through this historical account that we actually learn the ancestry of Jonah. Now, to give you a place to lock into as to where this is in history, uh, I've given you this map, and it's got, of course, we've got the southern kingdom, which only had the, the two tribes in it. All the other tribes went into the northern kingdom. And so you, you see uh, the area that's pointed to is Gath Hepper, and that would have been the territory designated as Zebulun uh, that, that went to the ancestors of that, that place. And so that kind of tells you where we are in, in time and space. Um, <clears throat> and it's interesting, uh, Jonah just assumes, as he writes his memoir here, that we know that. So now we see where his origin was. And so we hear that he's getting a call from that very place. And he's being asked to go into Nineveh. So where was Nineveh in relationship to this? Well, Nineveh is a major city in the uh, Assyrian Empire. It will be the capital of Assyria in the years to come. It's not at this point in history. 
But I want to tell you about the Neo-Assyrian Empire. It was ruled by Tilgath-Pileser III. And he, he went about, he was a very methodical king. And he wanted to uh, redo the whole internal uh, provincial system, if you will, so that he could restrict the power of anyone else, whether they be local, whether they be more widespread, because he wanted all the power to rest with the crown. He found that there was a lot of undercutting, under um, uh, corruption within the local government officials. So he was going to take that away. The second thing that he wanted to do, which it seemed like all powers of the day wanted to do, was to expand his territory into far greater reason. Uh, regions. Now to do that, because he was being, um, he was kind of under threat uh, of this area, uh, he will end up um, becoming a vassal state. And if you remember, we've talked about suzerains and vassals and so forth. And what a vassal state is basically saying, we don't know that we can make it on our own. And so uh, we're going to encourage the people of the Northern Kingdom who can't fight on their own, they don't have any military might, uh, they're scattered, they're decentralized. What we'll do is we'll say, if you'll come under the Assyrian Empire, <clears throat> we will protect you. You will pay us homage, you will pay us taxes. And because of that, and we will be your suzerain and you all then will be subservient. We will be your Lord, so to speak, and take care of you from other invading folks. So this is step one on the decline of the Northern Empire, because when they sell out, if you will, to this Assyrian uh, body of people, they've lost in essence their power and eventually they will become under their tutelage. Now to give you a time and space of this, now you can easily find on the left of your map there where Jerusalem is and all that area that is highlighted becomes the Assyrian Empire. And it's their whole plan to take over everything. And as you can see, they easily do that. And the, in the 1722, uh, uh, that empire, uh, uh, the Northern Empire fell, the Northern Kingdom fell, and Assyria took it. Now, Jerusalem and those two little tribes, they hung on uh, for a couple of more years, but they were under all of these different kinds of attacks. And there's a whole period of wars that are associated with that period of time, the 200 years before they would fall as well. But I want you to see the vastness of the Assyrian Empire. Now, the thing about the Assyrian Empire that you learn in reading other history books is that um, they love to brag about everything that they could conquer. They were hungry for power. They were hungry for land and territory. And so they love to announce that you know, to other pieces. Um, it would be ruled under Omni at, at some point, but they were an especially brutal empire. Uh, the Assyrians were known for this. They were known for exile, uh, driving people away from the place that they called home. And they were also known for economic oppression. Uh, they were merciless so that their enemies wouldn't even attempt to fight back you know, against them. And they wouldn't even, uh, you know, think about coming against him. And they were very proud of that image, you know, when you think about it. Um, there's some uh, horrible renderings of what the Assyrians did to uh, groups of people. Uh, like I said, they would go into villages. They would take all army people who were uh, eligible for uh, servanthood in the military. They would take those men away. Um, if there was any kind of fight, they would kill their wife or they would uh, impale their babies. Um, they would uh, kill people who weren't going to go along. And I think I've told you this, put their heads upon poles and parade them through town. They really worked through um, terrorism. And so if we're looking for a modern day analogy, it would be much the way ISIS still works in parts of the world. Uh, they want to create terror. They want to create fear and anxiety. So that you'll bow rather than fight back. And then they want to indoctrinate you into their way of thinking. And we see that happening in so many places of the world of that bringing those people in to believe in that particular call. And Nahum would write about this, another prophet, and about the bloody kind of revolt. So um, when you hear God say to Jonah, 
the word of the Lord, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because the wickedness has become before me. And we see Jonah ran. You know, when I hear this story about Assyria, about how violent they were and how proud they were of their violence and cruelty, he has every right to be afraid. Would you not think so? You know, he has every right. He knows the stories. He's heard them. And so, you know, for him to, to run is not out of the ordinary, you know, and I will say that sometimes even in our country, um, and I think because I was a product of the Vietnam War era, when you hear people who, you know, were draft dodgers, is because they had heard the stories of the Viet Cong, they had heard the things that were happening, and some of them didn't want to be a part of that, and so they ran. They didn't feel like they would ever be good at fighting back. But also we see within Jonah a hatred for these people. Here these people are living in Nineveh are part of the Assyrian Empire. And God is actually telling him to go in and to save these people whom he sees as Assyrians. They're in Ninevites, but they're more Assyrians, kind of like we're Tennesseans, but also Americans. And to his mind, he hates them because they're cruel, they have a terrible reputation. And why would God want to save those people? Because they are evil in the mind of, of the world and particularly of him. So why does he, what does he do? He runs. He runs away from the Lord and he heads for Tarshish. He goes down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Now, to get, let's go back to this map. You see where Nineveh is in the northern part of our map there. And do you see uh, where Joppa is? Okay, that's kind of the area that, that uh, you know, he's, he's trying to get away from, but he goes on into the tip, if you will, uh, of Spain. Now, the like um, Tarshish is in the southern part of Spain, and it's actually part of the Phoenician Empire. It's a trade emporium that specializes in marketing of tin, but here's the thing. Tarshish is 2,000 miles away from where he is right now at Joppa. You know, he is 2,000 miles away from this place he's going to flee to. In contrast, he's 600 miles away from the place that God is causing, calling him to. Now, if there's anything that speaks of his fear and hatred of the call that God has placed upon him, it's this alone to travel 2,000 miles away from Jerusalem to avoid having to go to Nineveh just seems to be the better answer, you know, as part of that. Now the question we think, well, why did God, why did Jonah think that simply by running, he could escape the message of God? And we have to understand that for the people living in that time, uh, Yahweh, their God was always locked into a place all polytheistic gods had a place of habitation. They would move into an area, they would put in a, uh, erect a statue of some type of this God, and that place was the only place in their mind that God could dwell. So when uh, Jonah is thinking about running away, well, for him, God lives in Jerusalem. They have a temple for him there. This is where God resides. This is where the Ark of the Covenant is. This is the very presence of God. So if he can just get away from Jerusalem in that area where he lives, then he can, in fact, get away from where God is. And he's going to flee to the sea in order to escape this um, uh, crisis that God is calling him to be. And so somewhere in the back of his mind, if he can get away from Jerusalem, he can get away from God's call. But then we know, living in our time, that we know that God is omnipresent, that God is wherever God wants to be. God is present in all kinds of places. And so we find him, though, in this story, heading away uh, for a 2,000-mile journey, and he is in the bowels of a ship. Now, we get to this point of our story, and we hear what happens to him upon that ship. And we hear it as told from a third person. So Jonah is stepping back and he is relating this story at some point in his life 
of is this is what happened when he entered into that ship. Of course, a great storm arises. And if you have your Bibles open and you want to turn to the first chapter, this is where the story, the, the thrill, you know, takes place right off the bat. And it says, uh, then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose that the ship was threatened to break up. So there's no doubt that this is indeed. And the, the interesting thing about this is what it says about the sailors. All the sailors were afraid and each cried out to his own God. Now, these are seasoned seamen. When seasoned seamen get afraid, then you know it's something. It's kind of like being on an airplane and watching a, a seasoned steward or, or stewardess, you know, uh, suddenly look panicky when the turbulent gets a little rough. That tells you the violence associated with that. And what they're th uh, going to do is it says they were going to, they, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. Now, the one thing that sea people get paid for is getting cargo that has been placed on board to, the, to its place of destination. So here again, it shows you how desperate they are. They're willing to throw away money, cargo in order to save themselves, their very livelihood in order to uh, face this, what we might now call a hurricane. And then we wonder, well, where is Jonah in the midst of this? Here the sailors are crying out, everyone, they're pagan uh, sailors, pagan religions. And so they're each crying out, if you will, to their own um, <coughs> God. And then uh, they hurl everything into the sea. And where is Jonah? This is what it says about him. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. And I'm thinking, well, maybe he was just sick as a dog. He's thrown up until he's exhausted himself. I don't know. But, you know, apparently he's, he's able to sleep through this because they're going to come down and they're going to wake him and shake him. Doesn't terror love to find someone else to be terrified with? There's something about being terrified that you don't want to go through it alone. And so they're going to wake him up and they're going to say, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us and we will not perish. So they're looking for a God that is a saving kind of God. Uh, they're going to look for someone who's going to pull them out of this. And then the sailors said to one another, come on, let's cast lots to find out who's responsible for this calamity. And the cast and the lots fell upon Jonah. So for them, casting lots was a sort of a form of divination where they could account, well, who brought this terror upon us? Because remember, everything that happened, whether it was in creation story, in the creation of the human body, whether whatever came upon them, it was the responsibility of some God somewhere that was making this happen. And so it would appear that it's the God of Jonah that was causing this to happen. Now, speaking a little bit um, about this sea, uh, throughout biblical uh, history, throughout all the biblical stories, the sea was um, its own entity. It was uh, considered uh, evil by just about every uh, polytheistic religion there was because the sea was a place of the great unknown. It had depths which could not be reached. Uh, it did things that could not be controlled. And within that sea lived things that they could not understand. Some of them were huge things. Some of them were small things. They knew that they could catch these small things and make meals upon them. But they also heard stories of the great things that they encountered in the sea. They would have encountered great sharks. They would have encountered, and in scripture, it calls them just the uh, Leviathan, the great uh, sizes of fish. But this living deity is not, that lives in this sea, it's not just the sea, but because of the darkness and the unknownness of it, they believe that Hades or hell, the depth of that, once it sucked you in, you could not come back from because that's what the sea did to people. They went overboard and were never seen again. And so they were sucked into Hades. They were sucked into the abyss and the great hell, you know, and at times it threw your body back out and landed it upon the beach. So it was its own entity of cruelty and evil 
And that's how they saw this. And so, you know, the sea was a very threatening, it still is to many of us, you know, we can't control the sea. We know that we have a much better understanding of it and of the creatures that dwell within it, but it is still a very powerful thing that acts only, you know, upon its own. And so when this great sea is attacking them, you know, then they're going to find, well, which God amongst all these gods who control the sea is responsible for this one? And it lands that it's Jonah's, Jonah's fault. And Jonah then identifies himself as a Hebrew. Now, when you're talking to other people, um, he's basically an Israelite. But when he talks to other people and identifies himself, he identifies himself by his religion. That would be like me saying, I'm a Tennessean to one group of people. But with somebody else, when religious circles ask me what I am, I'm Christian and then I'm Methodist, you know, that's kind of my identity. Well, because they're all talking about their gods, he identifies himself as a Hebrew, as someone of the uh, Israelite faith, but that he is a Jew. Well, now they're more frightened than ever because what they now believe is that the God he worships is the most powerful God there is and that he's angry with him. And out of his anger, he's gonna take all of them down with him. So Jonah comes up with a, a great response. He says that, yes, this is the God of the land and sea and you might as well just throw me into it. So this, you know, he says, pick me up and throw me into the sea and it will become calm. I know it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Now, isn't that interesting? You know, he knows he's fled. Guilt is all over him and he's going to uh, own up to, uh, well, if you want to blame somebody, you can blame me because the God that I worship is powerful enough to do this. And so, you know, he declares himself and what then must Jonah tell them to do as we move on into our story. Well, isn't it interesting that the men don't do what Jonah asked them to do? Instead, the men did their best to roll back to land, but they could not for the sea grew even wilder than before. And I have to kind of pause at this, it's a hurricane. The, the ship is being battered about and they think that they can row it into a safe place. Well, then they cried out to the Lord, please, Lord, do not let us die for this man's life. Look to the Lord they're speaking to. They're speaking to the God of Jonah because they recognize that they bought that it. It's this God that's angry. It's this God that is angry with Jonah. And so they're saying, please don't let us be the byproduct of your anger with him. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. So they, they don't want to throw him overboard because they think God's angry at Jonah, but he's going to be angry at them if they ended up killing him. So they're in quite the dilemma. But what else could they do? They're going to have to appease this God somehow. And so they throw him overboard. But before they do, they ask for forgiveness. And the raging sea grows calm. And because they saw that this act calmed the seas, well, suddenly they're revering this Lord of Jonah, someone who they've not revered before. They offer him a sacrifice and they make vows to him as to what um, he is. And so um, it comes to this question, whatever made Jonah think that he could outrun God as we get to this, that God's going to go, you're not going to be able to escape who it is that God is. But the, the, up until now, Jonah has uh, kind of passed the buck on everything. I shouldn't have to go proselytize to these people because they're mean, they're hateful, they're, you know, whatever. But I'm going to take responsibility, you know, for this. And so, like I said, they're going to try to row back to land. And he's just saying, just, y'all just need to stop. Uh, but even pagans don't want to kill an innocent man. And when they cry out for forgiveness, they see these immediate results. They greatly feared Yahweh and they offered a sacrifice made to him. You know what it is that comes out of this story? What comes out of this story is the story of evangelism and salvation. There are now new converts to this God of Israel based upon God's action. Jonah's testimony, this is the God that I worship. He has power over the sea. And of, and of all things, 
but he's forgotten that he also has power over Jotham. But he's the one that's going to cry out, and Yahweh has secured his witness from this unwilling missionary, if you will, at that particular that particular point of our story. And so, uh, before we move on, let's just stop there for a minute. Questions, thoughts? You're still awake? You're still out there? Hmm. Well, let me ask you this question. God lays upon your heart that you need to go to Iran and proselytize to the people who live there that um, are deeply infected with ISIS. How many of you are going? Not me. <laughs> I'm going to run. <laughs> you think you can outrun God? No. <laughs> He would tackle me before I got 10 feet. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like God has purposes with or without us. It will be accomplished. Yeah. Man, man, we fight it, don't we? What does it tell us about putting parameters on what we expect God to do of us? I think John, John, uh, I, why should I have to do it? Why doesn't God do it himself? Mm. Well, what he does. Don't no. bother me. God, just take care of it yourself, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> I, pray, I pray that they will change their hearts. Oh, you kind of like things the way they are. It's easy, you know, I, I've kind of grown comfortable hating them, right? Yes. And somebody greater than me is going to have to do that. So, yeah. Yes. It reminds me of how foolish, you know, when I entered seminary and really answered the call to ministry. Um, I've known of ministry throughout the world, but, you know, I kind of um, told God that there was a couple of things I would have an awful difficult time doing. And one is going to <laughs> India and working in the streets uh, with the nobodies. And the second one was going into prison ministry because there's something about the clanking of that door. I, I think in a prior life, I must've been in prison for something I didn't do, but that just claustrophobia or whatever, it just kind of freaks me out. Um, so I'm always looking over my shoulder because I'm, I, I don't know if God takes that as a challenge, like well, we'll just see about that. Um, but, uh, but, it does, but it does tell us that we kind of come into faith with a set of boundaries, how far we're ready to go with it. And, you know, so we're going to pause here and say one of, the, one of the parts of the story of Jonah is, are you putting boundaries upon your relationship with God and what God asks you to do? I think we do that. Oh, yeah. You know? And it could be something as, well, you know, I'll come to worship as long as it's at the time that I want it. Right. I'll come if they're singing the songs I want to hear or <laughs> playing the music I want to sing, or we do stuff like that, don't we? We yeah. put boundaries and limitations on, you know, what, you know, we ask us to do. And I do find, and we talked about this last week with Esther and the last week before that, you know, sometimes the call to do God's work comes at a very inconvenient time. <laughs> And, you know, and if you just, you know, and of course, the, you know, the standard thing is if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. And, you know, and man, don't we find that because we want it to fit nicely into our, our thing. And so we see, unfortunately, I think a lot of ourselves in the story of Jonah. We see a lot of ourselves in the character of Jonah, if we're going to be purely honest about it. Um, and I'm right there with you you know, in, in terms of that. Well, we move on into now the incredulous part of the story. What happens to Jonah, as you know, is once he's in the sea, it tells us that God appoints a great fish. So in 17 of the first chapter, we're still in the first chapter here, it's a fast paced story. He says, God provided, and it depends upon your translation, 
a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Well, wasn't that nice of him? You know, he provided, <laughs> when we think of God providing a fish, we're thinking of him providing a fish that we could actually eat. But in the stories, when y'all talked about it being a childhood stories, how does this great fish become a whale? Now, in the Mediterranean Sea, there were sharks, and they knew of sharks. They knew of great fish that would, would take and, and partake, you know, of men. And they also knew of that there were these huge fish that, you know, lived within the sea themselves. And like I said, they called them the Leviathan. Uh, they thought it was a form of a sea, uh, sea serpent that was kind of snake-like, you know, or whatever. And it's, you know, when it's mentioned, it's mentioned, the, the Leviathan's mentioned in some of the Psalms in the book of Isaiah and the book of Amos, because this was a very scary kind of creature that was there. There was this primeval monster or God that lived kind of into the depths of that. But in this particular story, this means fish. It doesn't mean Leviathan. It doesn't mean a definition you know, of anything else. But, um, and so it comes out though in a broader translation uh, as the word sea monster. And so for them, it is like this thing that they don't understand. And, and Jesus even picks up on that kind of terminology in the, in the New Testament story. But here we have this prophet and he's in trouble. And now he's been swallowed by a whale, a big, huge fish. He's in the middle to, of the Mediterranean Sea. And if, when we end that first chapter, we're like, oh man, his trouble just got um, multiplied. Now, I don't know about you, but being a product of Disney, I immediately go to the story, story of Pinocchio. And he's living down in, inside that, you know, kind of thing. And because we hear uh, Jonah praying from inside the fish and this beautiful prayer uh, in the second chapter when he realizes, well, now I've got really a mess of things. Okay, the people on the ship are going to be okay, but here I am. I'm running. I've been caught, literally caught in the mouth of this fish. I'm alive. And so he's got all these thoughts kind of running through his head. Now, in Dr. Richter's study of this book of Jonah, it's, it's interesting because she does a whole a take on, is it even possible that there could be a fish that's big enough to swallow a person whole and then to regurgitate them at some point? And so that she kind of distinguishes between sharks who don't swallow things whole, they take things out in chunks and eat them. But, uh, and she interviews all these maritime specialists. And so the, you know, one of the things that could be big enough to do that is called a sperm well. And that they do frequent the Mediterranean Sea and they have found them to be as long as 63 feet. And they're aggressive. Uh, and so if they find something in the water they don't like, they just simply consume it. And they, they, uh, uh, kind of swallow big amounts of something at one time and then they squeeze out the excess water and then they throw up the odd things that don't get squeezed out in, in terms of that and it says that they've studied these fish they found all kinds of uh, kind of odd things inside them uh, they find bundles of wire they find fishermen's boots uh, baby toys and that they said that an adult male sperm whale can uh, eat up to one to three tons of food. And so in sucking this in, scientists say it is possible that it could suck in air as well so that, you know, something could, could live inside there. So um, um, I brought to you a picture of one of these sperm whales. If you look at that, you can see there's a human sitting beside it. They haven't been swallowed by it that she kind of uses to reference her story. So the whole point of her whole big conversation is she kind of pressed marine scientists to say, is it even possible that a human could be swallowed by a whale? Was to basically say this, they don't really know. They don't really know if you could survive being inside of something, if they gulped in enough air and if they spit it, if they spit it out or with the acid of, of whatever. But the point of the story is do you believe in miracles? Because what God is doing is really uh, an act. If all of this is true as written, it's a miracle story. It falls right into the same categories. How does a man live in a tomb for three days as in the story of Lazarus and come out 
have his uh, clothes, death clothes taken off of him and march out as if nothing has happened. How does a child arise from the dead? How does a mother-in-law in Peter's case rise from the dead? How do these things happen? How does leprosy suddenly disappear when you put your hand inside a cloak and take it back out again? How does someone been blind from birth suddenly see? And so what you see is this, you know, you know, it, it falls right in line with the other miracle stories. And so, you know, can we believe it in that same kind of way? Or will we rather stick to the allegory, the metaphor, the parable, the, the fishtail, you know, kind of story of that? And so it, it sort of comes to that point. So let's just stop for a minute and talk about that. So what do you think? I think it's true. Well, scientifically, you can prove that you can be taken in whole, you know, but if you survive it, I guess is the question. But um, someone once sent me a picture of a uh, giant snake somewhere in the world, and they had cut it open, and inside there lay the full body of a man. It was a, a type of constrictor snake, you know, that suffocates you and then swallows you. Inside that was this full body of a man. You know, now for my son-in-law, who's really got a snakeophobia, I don't think that's what you call it, but a few of <laughs> virgins to snakes, you know, that just really, I had to send that on to him to further uh, uh, create things within him about snakes. But, but uh, you know, I think what we sometimes don't want to see in this story is a miracle. Mm -hmm. we don't, we've never thought of it as a miracle story. That the, we, we, we easily, more easily take the miracle stories of Jesus in the New Testament than the miracle stories of God in the Old Testament. You know, Jesus wasn't the only one that did miracles. God did a lot of miracles. Old women had babies. Mm -hmm. Old barren women had babies. Uh, people won in war against incredulous odds that they would. You know, manna fell from heaven, as did quails swarm the earth. You know, water came out of a rock. See, a donkey talked. See, these are things that we kind of skim over. And so I'm not sure why we've pulled the story of Jonah out as being like, oh, that just couldn't, that couldn't possibly happen. So... I'm not going to tell you what to believe. I'm just saying, for me, it was a transformative understanding that this story is a miracle story. And the story is about Jonah. It's not about Jonah speaking to other people. It ends up being, in the end, the story about Jonah and Jonah's faithfulness. So any other comments on that story? Well, it's, it's feasible. Um, no, the number, number three is a magic number in the Bible, and uh, there are dolphins in the Mediterranean Sea, and there are documented cases of dolphins uh, appearing to be assisting human beings that are struggling in the water. Mm -hmm. so it's not a stretch for me that a dolphin turns into a whale or what three hours turns into three days. Mm -hmm. probably felt like it was three days or three mm -hmm. months he was in there <laughs> the, the interesting thing for me is just the fact that uh jesus refers to this story you know i think that uh in and of itself certainly leads some credibility i guess that's so to speak I, I think that's uh i don't know that got my attention yeah, that you know that it's not a myth to him. It's he has validated the story and the and the life of Jonah. You know, so why are you going to question then what he had to write? Um, yeah, I don't think I. You know, I think that I think that it could have happened because I think God can make anything happen. Mm -hmm. uh, I. But to me, the the important thing is the lesson that I learned from it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's why I said, I think, unlike the other prophets who were saying, you all need to turn and change, what we're going to see in this story is the prophet himself had to turn and change. The prophet himself had to believe 
that God could do anything and that God, once he grabbed hold of you, was not going to let you off too easily <laughs> if he expected something from you. So it is interesting. Well, he comes out of that belly and I bet he stinks. So <laughs> because fish just have that smell about him. So uh, but moving on from that, God's going to give him a chance to rethink uh, his first command. He's, you know, basically he said, well, you know, you thought you could run from me, but I'm going to tell you a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim it to, to it the message I give you. Well, Jonah learned his lesson, and this time he obeyed the word of the Lord. He went to Nineveh, and now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to get through, according to scripture. Now, most biblical scholars say Nineveh wasn't that big of a city. Uh, they would not have taken three days to go through it. But there was a common practice in Old Testament time that almost as an ambassador or a, a diplomatic kind of role, if you went into the city, you stayed there for three days. So when he's talking about three days to go through it, that means three days he spent in this area given the message that he was supposed to give, give to the people. And the message he gives to people was really very simple. He goes into this city and he proclaims this, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. So it's, you know, the, the story is, if you all don't get your act together in 40 days, your this city is going to be annihilated and all of you are going to be vanished. You're going to be are killed as a part a part of this message. It's a very simple message, isn't it? Of you know, repent or you're going to die. Um, you know, and so you know that was his message everywhere he went. I'm this prophet. I'm coming to speak on behalf of the God of Israel, this God you all do not know, and my God tells me to tell you all that this is going to happen to you. Now it's incredulous to me that they believed him. And they said that they believed him. They, they, a fast was proclaimed and all of them from the greatest to the least put on a sackcloth. Now he's walking through the city of man seemingly from nowhere with no introduction or whatever, shows up in a city and he tells people to repent and believe. I think that's a miracle, you know, in, in part of it. And, you know, in part of this story. And it says from the greatest to the least, I mean, the king joined in. The king, too, was, you know, oh, dear, we've got to do something because we're errant people and we've got to put on these sackcloth and we've got to um, uh, go into this period of mourning because of what's going to happen to us if we all don't change and repent and mourn the life that we've had up until now. And so when it comes to this, what we find in these people, though, is they are vulnerable people. When you go and look in this period of history, you find that there's three things that have made them vulnerable. Militarily, uh, they're in a very difficult place. Uh, there is a war that is going on to the north of them, and, uh, and it's coming within 100 miles of their land and of their territory. And the fact that someone who would wage war against them, as Assyrian people have told you, have spent their life promoting terror in and of their own has shaken them to the very core of who they are. Another thing that's made them vulnerable is economically because there was, there were two recorded famines recorded in biblical history, one in 765 and one in 763. And that famine has called an economic deprived within their area because there's not enough produce and theft to sell or to market or to economically sustain themselves. But it's also, of course, caused a hardship upon the families themselves. So you have people who are leaving, you have people who are disengaged, you know, it, it's just a, an influx and it's a bad time economically. And then finally, there's a spiritual dis-ease among the people. There was a great eclipse, it's, you can, it's recorded in history, on June 15th of 1763. It was a total eclipse of the sun. And for them, they considered one of their gods to be Shamus, who was the god of the sun. 
And if during the day a great eclipse occurs and it blacks out this God that you worship, well, that's going to be a very frightening event, isn't it? So it's going to be a very scary start. So, so they're coming in and they're looking at all these things. <laughs> As I was doing this story, I thought, gosh, this sounds like 2020, doesn't it? We're all, what's next? Mm -hmm. Because all these bizarre things are happening here and we find ourselves vulnerable. We find ourselves vulnerable vulnerable almost in all these very same ways you know we hear of the buildup of nuclear arms in certain places and and the threats against us economically we're struggling and looking for a restart a due to the pandemic and then spiritually we have people thinking god's just mad at us he's mad at all humanity across the world and and so we're all being taken down by this little virus this little germ that's there so when when uh, Jonah shows up in the story and he's saying, repent, because you are all going to die. They're like, yeah, we've been expecting this. We know that there's going to be trouble coming, that the gods are angry with us because we've already had all these particular things that has happened. So there are people ready to listen and basically say, what can we do to fix this? And we can understand that because we think the same thing sometimes. What can we do to fix this problem? Well, they do what they only know how to do. They, they repent. They clothe themselves in um, uh, sackcloth. They sit in ashes because that's how they have learned that that's how you turn from evil and violence is part of that. And so they thought of, uh, they remember all the evil things that they've done, all the cruel dismemberments and deaths and things that they have done in the name of the Assyrian empire. So they've got a lot to repent about. And so, um, this is the story that they're going to kind of be brought to this and they repent. And you know what, instead of Jonah walking away, patting himself on the back and saying, boy, I've done a really good job. I answered the call of God and look, all these people are now bowing down and feeling grateful. I'm just ticked because these people that I hated are now going to be saved by the God that I worship. Can you relate to that? I hope not. <laughs> Why don't you think Joan is pleased? All these people are now saved. They've returned from their evil ways. <clears throat> It's sort of like the parables about the brother who goes and spends all his dad's money and the other brother stays home and works. The other brother comes back and is joyful and the kid who stayed home is mad. He said, it's not fair. I stayed home. You got the same award I did. I think it's sometimes how we feel when the death row inmate uh, uh, who's done these heinous things announces that they've been saved and are in right relationship with God. And we think, well, that just doesn't seem right. They did all these mean things and God's going to take them in too. What's it going to feel like if you arrive in heaven and you're, you're met and Hitler's there? Mm. Mm. <laughs> or the Every dimer. Exactly. And, the, and um, let me tell you, friends, we don't know what happens on the other side where repentance occurs. Mm -hmm. Some people think, well, Hitler would never be in heaven. And I'm like, how do you know? How do you know what that mm -hmm. conversation was like when he went up to the other side? He had a very troubled life. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if he repented, he would be a different person from the one we knew. But still, it would be astounding to find him there, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's what they say, uh -huh. that when you get to heaven, there's going to be us going, you made it? <laughs> and then they'll be looking back at us and going, and you made you it? You made it. <laughs> All right? Mm. Mm. Well, you know, it, and it's hard to turn from hating people 
that you thought were your enemy to loving them. And that's where Jonah finds himself. He has been sent into people who he truly wanted God to just annihilate. And instead, God's sending them a saving message. And, you know, and it reminds me sometimes it is far easier to hate because we have reason to hate than to find love with people, isn't it? We like to hold on to that hate and that grudges and Mm -hmm. um, all the wrongdoings. And we want to, and because in some way by holding on to that, it makes us look better before God because we didn't do any of that stuff. We think it elevates our relationship with God. And so now if Jonah and the Ninevites are even, he's not special anymore. You know, it just seems like, you know, they got off easy for all the horrendous things that they had done. And like I said, it would be the same as if us, you know, uh, God moving into Iran, totally taking over the town, excusing all the terrorist activities that we have bore witness to in our lifetime and to say, it's okay, it doesn't matter. It's what the South African peace and reconciliation talks taught us that it's a hard place to go. Whereas, you know, perpetrators uh, had to, to listen to victim stories. And then at some point they had to come to a, a set of forgiveness for it. It's the ultimate forgiveness kind of story. And Jonah's just not ready to go there. He's just not ready to let go of all that he does. So what does he do? He has a little pouty spell. So he, he, he's got, he's going to, He's going to go out and pout his little place. Um, says he's very displeased and a, with great, a great displeasure, he became angry. And he's, he's so angry that he would just rather die than to see the Ninevites repent and kind of get uh, a second chance at it. And, you know, you think, well, that's kind of extreme. Just because they got a second chance, you're so mad that you'd just rather die over that. And he's, he's angry that his uh, preaching is not confirmed and, and, and he's in, he did not, that the enemy didn't blow up and that they got forgiven. So he's angry that what he did on behalf of God worked. And so he's just so angry he wants to die. So he sits under this tree and he pouts and, you know, it's a lot of famous artwork is this little and um, a naked man, oftentimes, I don't know why he's naked. He's, he's sitting under this tree in a stupor pouting. And so when we look at that part of the story in four, six through eight, it says this. He says, um, then the Lord provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head and to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But as dawn the next day, the God provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die, and he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. And Jonah, and then God responds to him. Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do. I'm angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you've been concerned about the vine. You did not tend or make it grow. It sprang up overnight, and it died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? So God appoints this bond to remove the discomfort and John is so happy. Then a worm is appointed to attack this plant. And then God appoints this wind to come and blaze over his head and he begs to die. And then God speaks to him. So it's this odd end because the book ends with a question. You've been concerned about this plant that you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. Should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, which there was 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals. So that vernacular for right hand from the left, which means they don't even know which way is up. You know, and it's the answer to the question of, well, 
what then happens to the city of Nineveh? And I want to tell you what happens to the city of Nineveh, because there is history that tells us ultimately what happens uh, in that place of the world, in that place of time. Uh, in Nineveh, what you don't know is that uh, it will become embattled. Uh, this little province will become part of the battleground for Assyria. And it would, this king would take the people and he would uh, try to transform it into an independent country. But as often happen and we see in, in great history is that another king, King Sargon will come riding over the plain of the Fertile Crescent there. <coughs> he will take the area of Nineveh and he will burn it to the ground and all the 10 tribes who might have gathered there or been a part of that are scattered outside of that particular place. And so Nineveh, the town will be no more because the question is, Nineveh did what he was asked to by God, but he did no more. He went out, they were saved. He left them and went out into the tree and pouted. And the question that remains and why it's asking that is should I abandon them or not? Jonah's story, the story of his prophecy is he has a choice. He can remain there and teach the people about the God of Israel which would strengthen them to withstand a military might that came upon them in the future. Or he could do what he apparently did, which was to walk away and abandon the people and leave them into the hands of an invading territory. Jonah answered the call, but he didn't fulfill the call. He went and did just as he was told, and he did no more. Now, when we come to our faith of Methodism, I think it's one of the overarching things that why Methodism stands different than some other denominations. Many denominations are very concerned with people's salvation stamp. What day were you saved? What's the time, date, and experience? You're saved, okay, we're done here. Now I'm gonna move on and save the next person. And so then you meet people who quote, have been saved, but they're not disciple. They don't walk the discipleship path. They continue to walk in the way of darkness and away from Christ. And it was the very thing that John Wesley was very um, adamant about, which is why he formed small groups, why he held accountability, why he had class sessions to in order to keep people's feet, if you will, to the fire of discipleship. Because he knew that just accepting Christ would never be the end, that there was always much more. And he taught this in direct uh, contrast to Whitworth, uh, Whitmore, who at that time, what was his name, Whitworth, Whitfield, Whitfield, I'll get it here in a minute, Whitfield, who was like the Billy Graham of his time. He went about, it was a much better preacher than Wesley drew much bigger crowds, had huge salvation stories, but then he left the town and he didn't do anything else with them. And I always think of Whitfield more like the Billy Graham of our day. Let me roll into town, do the big event, and then trust that somebody, is, and when I leave town, is going to stay and disciple you. And how many thousands of people answered the call at a Billy Graham crusade, and then it stopped. They didn't go on. And Wesley put it this way, to not, in, in so many words, if to not disciple people is the same as um, bringing birth to a child and leaving it on the side of the road to die. And that was a common practice of the poor. If they could not afford a child, they gave birth to it, placed it on the road and hoped that somebody picked it up and carried it in and nurtured it. Otherwise it died there on the side of the road. And so he was using a very graphic image that some people kind of knew that that's what happens to your faith if you don't nurture it. And so the story here for Jonah is, you know, God doesn't say, well, just do the bare minimum. Just go tell people about Jesus, walk away and hope they got it. And the foundation for our particular Wesleyan faith is that 
life with Christ is much more than about your salvation stamp. And we believe when we follow the teachings of Jesus, Jesus spent far less time talking about heaven than he spent talking about how's it that you're living here on earth now. It's this kind of understanding that I'll take care of the heaven part, you take care of the living on earth part. And that's the fact that Jonah missed because Jonah was just mad at the people that they had been forgiven and he walked away. So that would be kind of like, let's say we have a Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, who's done despicable, heinous, awful crimes. And at some point, somebody goes and they testify to him and he decides that he's going to follow God. And then they walk away and he goes right back into the same practice as he was before. Because discipleship is about a companion walk. And that's the part that Jonah was, that's the story that Jonah's telling people. That's, he didn't get the message right. One, he ran from it. And secondly, when he went back, he didn't, he didn't wrap it all up. He did what he was supposed to do, but he did no more. So if there was a fifth chapter of Jonah, a beautiful chapter of Jonah, it would be that he got over his little snip, went back in, led the people to discipleship, and the land lived happily ever after. And it's a little bit like the story that we looked at last week about an unresolved feud, feud wasn't it? That when the people didn't totally do everything God had asked them to do, then 600 generations or 600 years later, generations are still fighting over the same kind of thing. And so you see the aftermath of kind of what happens when people don't do it. Um, so um, just concluding, you know, what, what do you think it is that we learned from Jonah's story today? We have to continue to work on our faith and not just leave it like that. Um, we got to stick with it. Don't run from God. He's going to find us. Yep. <laughs> Spend more time helping people. And I would add to that, Jamie, people that don't necessarily like us. Yeah. You know, we, we get very inoculated into our safe circles, don't we? I think the recovering alcoholic ministry does a great job of doing that. You know, if, if somebody's an alcoholic and says, I'm going to quit, and nobody helps them, yeah. their life fall right back where they are. You're exactly right. Yeah, that's a great, great analogy to that. We have to make sure our lives are different than the one Jonah lived mm -hmm. by fulfilling what God wants us to do and not just answering his call. We can't retire. <laughs> Don't tell me that. <laughs> well, you know, and I do think this whole thing that sometimes the people we, we disagree with theologically, politically, sometimes we're being asked to go and to give a message to those people that were much more comfortable just saying, well, I just can't have them in my life. They are just going to deal with that. And, you know, and that may be a, a place that, that God may call us to. And, and I think what we do learn when we say don't run is there's a cost to resistance. You know, there, there is, you know, there, there was a cost to the people of Nineveh for, you know, Jonah not totally you know, wrapping up the, the ministry there. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of what I see in this story is a very compassionate God. I mean, these are people who have done, you know, like I said, horrible, horrible things. And yet God still wants to save them. And we don't. We want to write them off and be satisfied they're going to hell. And that's where we're going to spend the rest of eternity. And we've wrapped that situation up. We just sometimes we don't want to give God credit for the compassionate God that he truly is. Because you know what it says in there, what God's response is, is these are 120,000 people who simply don't know any better. And they're animals. Now that's a compassionate God. He goes to lengths to, to include his animals in this, you know, this discussion there. Well, you now, know. Go ahead, 
I was just going to say it's like the disciples that he chose. I mean, you know, they weren't the cream of the crop. <laughs> I mean, you know, and I think, I think that is what he's teaching us to accept everyone, you know, no matter. There's a good side to everybody is what I think he tries to teach, even though the bad side comes forth more. You need to look at the other, the other side of the corner of a person. Well, I want to wrap around to something Mary said early, which is, why didn't God just fix it? Why did he have to bother Jonah to go in there and do that? <laughs> you know, the thing that we learn over and over is God does work, but he works through his people. He doesn't order it straight everything down from heaven. He implants within us this Holy Spirit that guides us and says, I need you to go forward and do my work. And I know I've told it many a time, but I'm repentant, you know, like the two, the two rabbis walking down the road and one of them turns to the other and says, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God why he didn't help people more. And the rabbi, other rabbi says, well, not me, because he may ask me the same question. <laughs> and so, you know, the, the story of that, you know, really is that if God was asking Jonah to be God, in that situation to be the, the God of compassion that could change the hearts of people. And he did it, but then he left, he left mad. He left, you know, he didn't like what God was asking him to do. And he was resentful. And he says, if you want to, if you want to see the work of God being done, then you get off your duck and you go do it, whatever that looks like. But we, and when I say we, I'm including, you know, in this, it'd just be easier to sit back in my rocking chair and think somebody ought to do something about that, right? <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. so sometimes that compassion, that forgiveness, that giving, I have to ask, where am I in that? Where do I get to be participate in that? Um, so those are the lessons I took out of Jonah. Uh, mm -hmm. You all probably have more. But closing comments or ideas. You told us once <clears throat> that we never knew what happened to Jonah afterwards. Well, I don't think we don't know what happened to him. But like I said, obviously, he abandoned the people of Nineveh because 100 years later, they were overtaken and they died because they were easily annihilated by the separateness from God. That's what history tells us. So Jonah probably went off still resentful, still pouting. <clears throat> but I think at the same time, though, I think he did see maybe in the time to come because he wrote the story. Hmm. Because I think he went away wondering about the answer to that question. Why should I not care? Ask God about these poor, ignorant people and their animals. And I think Jonathan, Jonah probably spent the rest of his days asking that question. And I think it's purposely left open because that's what the question we're asked, right? Why should I care about the, the poor people who won't get out and get a job? Why should I care about the people who, you know, have made choices to go into drugs? Why should I care about alcoholics? Why should I care about people that don't have enough food? Why should I care about um, people who have more babies than they can afford? Why should I care? And on and on I can go. Right. Ooh, you are pondering just like Jonah's. Ooh, Jonah's. <laughs> Shouldn't we care because God cares about them? Bingo, yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we should, but the question is, do we? Yeah. Because we'd rather spend more time in judging them than caring for them. Right. Guilty as charged. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we will close there today. So let's close with a word of prayer. Uh, Almighty God, we thank you for this ancient message of Jonah. 
it's hard to believe it's been nearly 3,000 years since his story occurred and was recorded orally and in written form for us to ponder over today. And we thank you for the understandings of the nuances of the story and how great and miraculous you appear in it. For we learn that you are ever present in all situations. We learn, oh God, that you can make the miraculous happen. We can learn, oh God, how compassionate and caring and loving you are. But we can also learn how much like Jonah we are. How sometimes we are resentful. How sometimes we don't want to do your work. How sometimes we run from you thinking we've got a better idea. And sometimes, God, we don't want to see the compassion that you have. We'd rather hold on to the hardness of our own heart. So wherever we find ourselves in alignment with Jonah, we ask your strength <clears throat> to transform more into the likeness of you. And for all the lessons that Jonah admits to in the telling of his own story, may we self-reflect and see within ourselves places that we need to change so that your people can learn the message and can we learn to walk alongside of them as they grow more in love with you. For then, oh God, we'll have done the work of discipleship. These things we pray in your holy name. Amen. 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 Thank, Thank you, God. Well, Thank you, you all for being here. And uh, continue to take care of yourselves. And um, um, y'all are looking healthier. Y'all vaccinated people. <laughs> a little less anxious, a little less fearful. So let's just keep it up. So. My blessings to each of you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, Joanna. Bye. Thank you.